to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. It's Power Talk Friday. Today, we're talking with Jessica Harling, a friend of mine from Exciting Windows. Jessica is what we call window treatment royalty. She is a fourth generation window treatment specialist and the founder of Behind the Design and a leading expert in employee and process development for design organizations. Before I tell you a little bit more about Jessica, I want to share some really exciting news with you. Vin, myself, and our cousin and Bill are so thrilled and so proud to announce we are now the co-owners with Steve Burson and Steve Wishnow of Exciting Windows. (laughs) That's right. We are joining the ownership team and we are beyond chomping at the bit to deepen and strengthen all of the already so many positive aspects of Exciting Windows, as well as to infuse new ideas, new initiatives, and new strategies for growth and success. I thought that this episode with Jessica was the perfect opportunity to share this wonderful news with you because Jessica is one of those already amazing resources that we all know and love as members of EW exciting windows. (laughs) She is with us for our conferences. She lends her expertise and experience through workshops and one-on-one coaching and training. And I'm so delighted that this new endeavor of ours will have me working with her even more closely over the coming years. And I know what you're thinking, how in the world is Luann, are you adding one more thing to your plate? Well, as Vin said, we not only add things to our plate, we add new plates. I'm kind of laughing, but a little afraid, but no, it's in her blood. And I guess, you know, truthfully, I've told you before how much we have come to appreciate and value everything about Exciting Windows. So the opportunity to be an owner of Exciting Windows, well, this was just something that Vin and I and Bill just would not pass up on. So if you are in the window treatment business, please consider joining us and stay tuned as we put our Lou, Vin, and Billy spin on things. Now, Jessica and Behind the Design. Behind the Design offers recruiting, on-site and online training, and operations development consulting. Jessica's company helps interior design and window treatment professionals streamline costs, increase productivity, and develop rock star employees that help you take your company to the next level or just help your company perform at the level you're at, okay? We've already learned so much about hiring and recruiting from my show veteran here, my cousin and co-author, Eileen Hahn. But hiring plays such a big part in the success of our business that I know there's always more to learn. And sometimes we need it to hear it a different way, right? We need to hear it a different way. So let's Let's get to it and let's see how Jessica breaks down the recruiting and training process into clear, actionable, bite-sized pieces. Hi, Jessica. Thanks so much for joining me on a well-designed business today. Hey there, Luann. I'm very excited. Jessica, this is, you know, I feel like I've been saying this a lot lately. This is a long time coming. (laughs) (laughs) I'm actually so mortified and embarrassed now at the long line to get on my podcast. It's like, (laughs) I'm so grateful and gratified. I have to say that there's so much interest, but it's a little silly when somebody, you and I are friends and we are business colleagues and we've worked (laughs) together side by side at exciting windows for years now. And I'm like, I can't get you in for six months. <laughs> well, we did it. I know we did. We did. And I'm glad that we did because as I just said, 
you know, you are um, one of my colleagues at Exciting Windows. You come in as a consultant to us at the window treatment professionals that are members of Exciting Windows. You're one of the people that we look to that you come in and do training seminars for us um, and presentations for us. And they're, you know, I said to you when I first met you, I'm like, you just like my cousin Eileen. You are the lady that knows how to hire and how to train and do all that good stuff, right? That's right. Exactly. A lot in common. That's it. And so, and so you have had um, where Eileen has worked across many, many di- different disciplines and from uh, companies, you know, from small all the way to, to billion dollar companies. You have pre- really pre- um, predominantly focused on window treatment professionals and of lately interior design professionals as well. And so we're going to pick it apart today. Uh, you share the belief that Eileen has is that. It is it is so important for us as business owners to attract and to retain our top talent. And as opposed to, you know, just doing it any old wishy-washy way without a proven system. And, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you, what was that old thing years ago when computers came in? It was G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. So today, um, I want to say we're going to talk, you have this power triangle that you talk about. There's three pillars that you have identified in your business that you lean on and you help us as entrepreneurs understand the three pillars in order to make good hires to begin with in order to train them the right way the first time around, and then to develop a process that really provide you with consistent, stable results every time you do this. And I'm sure it also provides a stable result, uh, a stable process for the employee to succeed and throw flourish within your firm. So these are your three things, right? That's right. Yeah. I, I firmly believe in those three things is going to keep someone for a, a very long time in your business. And and that's a you know, I know that's been a goal of ours at Window Works because the turnover is expensive. You know, you have somebody come in, they they train, they don't work out, and it's just you may as well just taking that, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars, however many months they're there and just ripped it up, right? That's right. <laughs> so so start us off on it, uh, Jessica. How what what you it starts with getting the right people and attracting the right people. How, what are your thoughts on that process? Absolutely. And one of the things I want to start with is just the mindset of this and, and a business owner in, in my experience. Um, you know, I came from a, a long generation of um, window covering professionals. I'm fourth generation. And one of the things that was so evident to me as I was um, in the HR department uh, for, for my family was this idea that, you know, we had to retain top talent. And I was so fortunate that, you know, my family always believed in education and they sent me all over the United States to businesses and vendors and, and trying to figure out the key to this. Uh, because it is so costly. It can cost up to 30 and sometimes 40% of a, a person's salary in terms of turnover. So it really boils down to three things. And, and you had mentioned that it's recruiting, training, and then having a right process to lead your team so that they know what to expect, you know, what you're expecting of them and what they can expect and, and trust of your company. So Starting with recruiting, um, you know, it really goes to what Eileen has talked about in the past, actually episode 589, um, knowing what you want out of that person, out of that role, and really for your company. Um, And I I encourage everyone to go listen to that episode because she really talks about um, getting clear on that. And once you're clear on it, then you can follow a couple of key steps to to get the people in the door for you to even interview them. Um, and it starts with the hire ad. So, you know, I want you to think about when um, you are marketing your your company, you're talking about 
with your marketing company, a target customer, a certain demographic, a little certain territory. And those are all the same principles that you would use in marketing that you would do in recruiting. So your higher ad that you place out there, you know, or share with your team to, to share with their friends, it's got to attract. It can't be so hum, ho, hum <laughs> and, um, you know, boring. These are the responsibilities. This is what, you know, the benefits, the compensation, like that's what everyone's going to say. So you really want to attract the the top person with the language that you're using in the higher ads. And then you have to be clear on the process of the interview because a lot of business owners go into this process just winging it. You know, they get a resume, they pull them in, and then they just show up to, to the interview and just start asking whatever comes to mind. And that is not going to attract top talent. Top talent tends to... Um, want preparation, even if they're good at winging it themselves, they, they want to feel like they're being valued. And a big part of that is the owner or manager coming prepared for that recruiting interview process. So you are, you, your, your values and your principles regarding this process do align with Eileen so um, really perfectly. And um, it is something that she has taught us over the years is about that higher ad, right? It's, it's, it's really no different than an interior designer. You know, what, what I've learned is, is that in order to create the right higher ad, you have to do the step before it, which you mentioned, which is get clear on what the job is that you want done and what kind of individual you want it to, to do it. Like what type, you know, energetic, low key, you know, fast paced, slow paced, all those things, because that's how you create the language of the words that attract that person. And in, for an interior designer, it's no different than if you looked at an empty room and somebody said to you, well, make a beautiful room. And, you know, any designer worth their salt would say, well, do we want it to be contemporary? Do we want it to be modern? Is it a bedroom? Is it a bathroom? <laughs> Is it a living room? It's, it's, it's that same, that, don't you see that it, you agree that it, it crosses and it's exactly the same. It's like, whoa, take a step back. What are the job descriptions? What are the duties that this uh, person will do? What type of skill set is necessary? What type of personality do I visualize being successful in this type of role? And then you can start to make your your job higher, right? Your ad higher, right? Exactly. And then it goes beyond even into the nuts and bolts. It's being prepared for the frequently asked questions, either writing it in the ad or interviewing it. So you know, things like who who's this person going to report to? What does a day in the life look like? If they're doing procurement, what sort of technology are they using or organization process? If they're doing the, the sales and the design, um, who are they meeting with? How often? The schedule, you know, the culture of the team. So you have to be prepared to answer those questions. And that is part of the discovery process before you even place the ad. Right. I love it. I love it. And I've also learned through Eileen and for you, I keep saying from Eileen only because I work so closely with her, but of course, through our um, conferences, Exciting Windows, when you've presented, I've learned it from you as well, is that the job description for like, for example, in a window treatment company that you put out there, not the job description, the ad that you put out to attract an installer is completely different than the ad that you put out there to attract somebody to sell for your company is completely different from the ad that you put out there to be the office administrator. Whereas, you know, back in the day, we'd be like, Window Works is hiring. We're amazing. We're in Livingston. If you want to work <laughs> for us, we're looking for installers. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, Okay, mm -hmm. you know, and the thing is, you don't realize how ineffective that is, I think, sometimes until you've been taught to do it this way that you suggest doing it. And then it's like, oh, what a difference, right? Mm -hmm. Night and day. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And I know that um, that process internally as the owner of the company of really getting clear, one of the things that I've learned is that I, I I a lot of times focus on the, the the fast pace or slow pace of an individual. Like Vinny will always say, I like people around me that have a motor. 
That's his language. Mm-hmm. You got to have a motor, right? But mm-hmm. the thing is, what we've learned when we really pick it apart is, you know, our data entry person doesn't really need to have a motor. Our data entry person needs to be very steady and very detailed, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's stepping away from the type of personality that you jive with and really zeroing in on the types of skill sets and attributes for the job description, right? Right. And it's stepping away from yourself yes. because a lot of people, you know, they, they experience who they are. So they think, you know, others will come to the table like that. But as Eileen has mentioned in the past too, you, you have to, um, hire someone that's your complement. That's something, you know, that has a superpower you don't. Mm-hmm. So you do have to take that step back and look at what is actually going to be successful for this person in this job and question, you know, whether or not you are, are right in your thoughts, you know, talk to, to Vin or another partner and, and, and look at, um, you know, a step back that high level look of what actually success is going to mean for that position. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it is, it is, it is night and day when you do it. I just, um, I can't, I cannot stress it enough how, you know, the language when you, and you just check yourself on it, whatever role you are performing in your company, think about the, the jobs, the parts of your job as the owner, um, that you love doing. And then think about, What is it about it that you love doing? And if an ad is, hey, looking for designer, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or if it's like, you know what, I can't think of the words because I don't know how to do it for every position. But, you know, the idea is a salesperson, we're going to talk about the pace and the diversity of the clients and every day is different and all of that stuff. But an office administrator, we're like stable environment, a family owned business, <laughs> come every day <laughs> where you're, you know what I mean? Show up and do yep. your job, be important to them. You know what I mean? It's, it, there's <laughs> just differences and it's all true about your firm. It's just, what do you pull out, right? That attracts the individual skill sets. Is that right? That's right. And everyone has a place, you know, you have a place with, um, your company, the candidate has a perfect fit for, for themselves. So it's just a matter of just reaching and and interviewing as many as you can. I mean, I, I always do a hundred to one. Do you want to find one fabulous person that you are going to spend the next 10 years with? You have to search through a hundred resumes to find that one person. So it does take time. It is, you know, looking for that unicorn or that needle in the haystack. But if you are clear on what you want, it's a lot easier to sift through. And and by the time you get to that one, if it's right, you'll know and it'll feel really good because they'll check off all the boxes on mm-hmm. your list. And it's funny because I guarantee you that dozens of listeners now just went, a hundred (laughs) resumes, but I'm going to tell you what, when you do it right. And we just hired two people in the last four months, Catherine and Diana and more than 260 resumes, 280 resumes each for each hire. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's nuts. And then you, and, but you're right. When you really have made your hardcore list of everything you're looking for, when you're doing those resumes, you take 260 resumes down to 25 like that. Right. And Mm -hmm. I say, you know, you, as if I did it, it's like, no, Lisa does that for me. (laughs) Like I don't have the patience (laughs) for that. (laughs) And that's another thing, honestly, to hire out the recruiting process to someone who is skilled and talented in it also has paid uh, its weight in gold for us as well. But that's the thing. Lisa will literally, she will say to me, Lou, I've reviewed 272 resumes this week. I have three people that I'm making phone calls with. And then two days later, she'll be like, you're having a phone call with one of them like it's crazy it's crazy Mm -hmm. but that's how you get good people and that's how I got Catherine and Diana so so grateful for that process so okay so now 
And by the way, again, to relate it to interior designers, it's the same thing. You would not hesitate to look at 50 sofas for the right sofa or whatever, the 50 paint mm -hmm. colors for the right paint color, you know, and you're actually going to live with this person for a lot longer than you are going to look at that sofa in your client's house. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, but another key for this whole process is training and I know this is an, a major superpower of yours. I have had many of our colleagues in Exciting Windows rave about your skills for coming insight, on site into their businesses and developing a training program for the different positions in their company. Our friend Rick Baker has used you. You have uh, you know, really outlined his entire training program, and he does a lot of hiring, right? He's unusual, and most, most businesses don't hire as many people in a year as he does. But the idea is mm -hmm. that you systemized it for him. So talk to us a little bit about the training, how to develop it, what's important, what do we have to think about, Jessica? Sure. So I I'm going to break it down to um, five P's, P is in Paul. Mm -hmm. We've got process first. Um, for any position, any, any new um, employee that you're bringing in, whether they are um, uh, entry level or experienced, we got to go through the process of what the company is offering as an experience to the customer. And really, for them to get a whole understanding, we need them to, to understand every element of the process, not just the position that they're doing. While that's critical, they won't understand how they fit into the greater scheme of things. So in the very first week of a training program, we always do process first, um, shadowing your team members, um, going through you know, the actual sequence of a customer from the moment you market to them and they call uh, your, your establishment to schedule time or an onsite with you all the way to that install the new candidate, the new hire has to understand every single step in sequence so that when they're dealing with the customer for whatever role that they're in, they will be able to answer broad questions like, what's next after you? Mm. Or if I do this again, what comes first? So process is the first foundation for your new hires. So that's your, your first P. Your second P is product. So whether you are, um, you know, procuring a, a certain type of material, um, you know, whether it's an add-on furniture, window coverings, what have you, or if it's the, um, the designs, the, the AutoCAD sketches, the SketchUp sketches that you're putting together, that's your product. That's your, your design. So they have to understand um, what are you selling, the, the tangible and the intangible. From there, they have to understand the paperwork and the pricing. Mm. So even in you know every single position, think about a, a warehouse guy. You might think, well, why does he need to know paperwork and pricing? Well, if he's checking in the boxes, he needs to understand how to read the paperwork to notify the team that those boxes are in. Right. Um, or or the pricing. You know, if if a customer calls and needs a ballpark, empowering the people around you just to give them broad numbers. Um, to, to give the confidence to the customer that you know what you're talking about. And then the last P is people. Um, they have to understand how to interact with each other within the business and how to interact with your customers. So whether that is, you know, for your designer salesperson, the the step-by-step -step sales process of meeting with a customer on site, whether it's residential or commercial, um, they have to understand what that interaction looks like, what is expected in terms of timeframes of the communication, and and what is the, the don'ts of the communication communication mm. you know what shouldn't you talk right. about so all of those when done in sequence and that's the sequence that i just explained process product paperwork pricing people that sequence allows a um a very logical way of learning their role and ultimately how they relate to the overall company. So i find this very interesting um my question for you on this is being window treatment specific for a moment, 
when we think about you're saying, come on and do the process, what does the company offer our customers as a full experience and shadowing team members and outlining the client sequence from they say hello or they send an email and then this happens and then that happens and that happens. Do Mm -hmm. you, Jess, is this something where, hey, this is, you know, a two hour discussion on your first day of training, and then you move on to product and la la la? Or are we spending a couple of days in process or a week in process where we're not introducing product and paperwork and pricing other than how it might come across our, our, you know, our world as we're shadowing and as we're doing these things? Tell me a little bit about the nuts and bolts of that training process. Sure. So I like to break it down into a four week um, plan. So the first week is process. And, you know, just like we talked about the numbers of of recruiting, a week in some people's minds could be um, very long. You know, some people will have a training process for one week and one week only or so, one day or one conversation or one, right. <laughs> here's exactly. the phone are we good i'll see you later <laughs> right. our, our company so, is called window works by the way when you answer it no <laughs> <laughs> right. oh gosh <laughs> back in the old days before i didn't know how to do it <laughs> <laughs> anyway so we spend a week in process is it what you're saying right okay. and and i i want to to clarify that it doesn't have to be one person for the entire week. So we are training adults here. You know, we're not training kindergartners or grade schoolers. <laughs> we're training adults. So just because we have to do a week of process doesn't mean you singularly as the owner, even if you're a, a one man band and hiring your first person, it doesn't have to be up to you for the entire 40 hours in that first week to spend every waking moment with that person. So what you can do is if you have other team members, even if it's a contractor, send them out with the installer for the day, send them out with, you know, you on the job site for the day, Um, have them sit with your scheduling person and, and shadow them and how they're asking, you know, certain questions. So they understand again, what's coming before them and after them. So you can use the people in your life to, to implement um, or train that process, it doesn't have to heavily rely on your time. Okay. And so for an interior design firm, you know, when you hire a new uh, junior designer or even, I mean, would you, even if you were hiring a senior designer, somebody that comes in and has had five or eight years experience, you'd still put them through this process, my guess is, because you want them to do it your way. Is that correct, Jessica? That's right. And there's, there's other steps, you know, we'll talk about the other four P's that you can condense if they're more experienced, but the process is the foundation for how they interact with you and your customers. So that has to be set no matter who the new hire is. Okay. Okay. So now we're, we're in this knee deep in this process uh, component week one. So if I am an interior designer and I've her- hired anybody for my team, so if I've hired an expediter, if I've hired an office man, if s- junior designer, senior designer, I'm going to theoretically that week, I'm going to maybe have them come with me on a consultation. And the next day, maybe they're going to go to an install or they're going to go to a photo shoot. And then the third day they might spend time sitting with, if I'm hiring a senior designer, maybe they're going to sit t- spend time sitting with the expediter if I'm hiring an expediter maybe they're going to spend time with a designer in the showroom or they're going to sit in on a design presentation you're actually saying regardless of the position that this first week is for exposure to your firm's entire client journey right for lack of a better way to describe it so that they can see how all the pieces come together the first week they're in the firm and even though they don't understand everything yet and they don't know how to do everything yet they're getting that full picture is that what you're saying that's right Mm. we want them just to shadow and observe in that first week because the next weeks are going to be detailed and if they don't know the big picture they can't sit and pay attention to the detail 
um, and actually let that sink in. So the process, the first step of the process is critical in getting them even excited about your company. Mm. Show them what your value is and how customers love to work with you. Get them excited and then get into the nitty gritty. That's pretty amazing. I like that. That's pretty amazing. I um, have not done that before. And that's interesting. I like that idea. I like it when you just said, you know, A, just from that standpoint, they've just got this new job. And why do we like bring them through the front door and like put their head down in a box and say, here, read this manual, <laughs> like, right. <laughs> right? Like get them excited. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. I love it. Okay. And of course for window treatment professionals, we hire an installer. He goes, he or she goes on a sales appointment. He sits and listens while the phone gets answered. You know, he maybe observes somebody in the showroom helping somebody and all the way around. That's right. I love it. I th- also think too. I can see the value in. Uh, I've often said, and this is this uh, this I have done in our company, but it's I've never taken the step of sending office uh, personnel on installations. And of course, salespeople have always had the opportunity. Often they will go on an installation, but. Um, Anytime there's any nudginess in our world at Window Works, like in in the, in the culture, in the the people, in the sandbox, if there's any nudginess with that, then it's usually mm-hmm. coming from maybe the scheduler has been scheduling the installers too tight and it goes Mm -hmm. one day and it goes three days and it's two weeks and now the installers are getting grumbly. You know what I mean? But they're not going to walk through the door and say, hey, you're doing me too tight here. You know, they just sort of are grumbly about it. And at the same time, Mm -hmm. what I noticed is that we might have a busy period and installers are scheduled for one job at nine, another job at two, another job at four. And they will have, I'll be aware that the showroom coordinator is often not getting the call in time for an appropriate alert to the next customer that we're not making our appointment time. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm hearing on the phone, well, if you could have let me know an hour ago, now she's mad because you're supposed to be there in 15 minutes. And what I always know is it comes down to them not understanding the other person's job, not really knowing what it's like for the installer has no idea what it's like when somebody calls up and says, I can't believe it. Your guy was supposed to be here at three. It's 315. Where is he? An installer is his brain is like saying to himself, 15 minutes is a problem. But when you're the customer... Mm-hmm it's a problem. And when you're the showroom coordinator, it's your problem now and you didn't create it. (laughs) Right. Right. Exactly. And it it boils down to respect. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like when you understand what the other person is doing, you have a greater respect of their job and that shows through to the customer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, in the, when I was in sales, I always would build up my project manager. Okay. Customer, you're going to be assigned to this amazing project manager. She works on all my stuff. You know, I love her. This is why you're going to love her. And it builds the confidence for the customer. So we want that mutual respect going across the board because that shines through and and makes your company look better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I have solved that problem in the past by we've sat installers down and told them to answer the phone for the day. And mm-hmm. you, but I've never sent a show coordinator out on the install truck. <laughs> so <laughs> that's something we could do. You know what I mean? We really could do it. I like that. So that's great advice. Okay. So that's week one. We're all about the process, about really expressing from the beginning to end the, cl- the entire client journey. So our new hire, regardless of their position, sees how all the jigsaw puzzle goes together, right? That's right. Okay. And then the next week, is it a week of product? Take us through the next pay product. Yes. So product is a full week um, before you move on to the next step. So product is product and services. So they need to understand in that, that week, what is the physical, tangible things that you're delivering to a customer, whether that is, you know, your procurement services, your design services, your install services. But then beyond that, the, how do you discuss that with a customer? So If you are a designer and we're bringing on a designer, we need to teach them 
what questions are the customer going to ask and how are we going to respond to that with the expertise um, backing you up? What you're learning in the product week is the tangible application of what you're discussing with the customer and, and that expertise. I always call it Dr. Decorator <laughs> or Dr. Designer. Um, and then we got to go to those repairs, service, and warranties. What's going to happen if it breaks? Um, first of all, how do we talk about that? What's normal and not normal? Um, and then how do we communicate that to the customer? So if you are a designer, we're going to be speaking designer language in that product week. If you are in customer service or you're a project manager and you're in the office, then we have to talk about more, um, less about the, the sales or the application and more about how to fix things because the, the project manager is not responsible to specify what's going on. They are responsible to fix it if something goes wrong mm. um, or make sure that it gets done on time. So it's the type of language that we're using in product week has to be specific to the person that you're training. Okay. So for instance, the product week will look very different for a salesperson or a designer position that it would than it would for an office administrator or an expediter. They might be some overlap in in the information given about the products that your firm does, but we're really talking about getting into the language the, the the jargon of that position is what we're saying. That's right. And even more specific to that jargon, um, we have to get the new hire to understand when a customer asks a frequently asked question about a product, whether it's the quality or um, the, the colors, what patterns it comes in, whatever it may be, you know, we have to give them the language we want them to respond with. I've seen a lot of trainers give them the inside scoop, but then talk about, oh, well, we wouldn't say that to a customer. Mm. So don't tell them that in the training then. Keep that to yourself. <laughs> tell them what they can say to a customer. Right. Okay. So for each position. So if you're training an interior design assistant and you would have maybe a conversation about when you're with me in the field and I might be off talking to the electrician, if the client client comes up to you and says, you know, when are the, when is the tile going to be delivered? You know, your answer is, I don't have that answer. <laughs> now, like, like you, your principal right. says what you want them to say. You don't leave, you, you, you think of as the business owner, the types of things that that position is going to be faced with most often, whether it's through the phone or face-to-face -face meetings, whatever, and start teaching them how to answer the specific questions, even if it is to say, I don't know, or you were going to, it's somebody else's job. But if it's, you can know it, then how do you do it? Right. That's right. Okay. That's interesting too. Wow. This is great. <laughs> <I'm> loving this. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now we go to paperwork, right? So this, this stinks. I hate paperwork, but yeah, we have to do paperwork. <laughs> right. I do too. <laughs> so week three is paperwork and pricing. Oh, okay. So the, the reason why we're doing this in sequence is product, just like our first week of, of process, the product week is more overview. It's the introduction to the different products and services that you are, you're giving. Now you're getting even more into the, the nitty gritty, you know, the, the funnel getting down to the point where we're going to go through literally the same exact sequence you did in product week. So let's say, you know, day one is furniture. Day two is, is design. Day three is um, window treatments and, and so on. Um, you're going to follow that same sequence the following week and go through every single product that you did the week before, but then apply it with paperwork and pricing. So essentially you're getting then a layered in training of the product, but you're teaching them how to, to write it and price it kind of like when you learn a language, um, you know, you're, you're reading it first, you're understanding it, and then they make you write it. Then you make, you know, right. they make you say it out loud. Right. 
So that's the same concept that we're building upon and therefore they're actually getting two to three weeks of product training then, which is always the, the biggest hurdle for a new hire that doesn't come with experience um, into it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mentioned before, you can expedite some of these things if they do have experience, um, but you're still going to follow the same sequence. You're still going to do product first, then paperwork and pricing. You just might be able to get through those, all those much faster mm. to get them into the field faster if Understood. they come with experience. Right. Understood. Okay. So that's very clear too. I love that. I love that I can visualize. And, and now to your original first point, when I sit down and and I want to teach somebody how to price something or how to fill out paperwork if they from from week one with process, if they've understood like in our our business, you know, the paperwork follows an order all the way through. It starts with the showroom coordinator filling it out. Then it goes to the salesperson. Salesperson makes a contract out of it. Then it goes back to the office to be ordered. Then it goes back out to be scheduled. Then it goes out of the house, you know, to the installer in the home to for installation. Then it comes back to the th your showroom coordinator to be <laughs> checked and then you know, it's like this big, it, the, the paper trail, the one piece of paper goes all, it has, it has its own journey and it has certain steps and it has to go through all the steps. But if I've been, and, and I have to say that has been a very difficult thing to train. And if I have a nickel for every time somebody says to me, especially in their first six or eight months working for me, I'm not sure what I do with it now. And I'm just like, uh, you know, not the first day, I'm not going to say this, but I'm like, I'll say, well, you know, the manual's right there. It tells you the paper trail. <laughs> like, you don't need to open it up, <laughs> right. look at it. And it's not because I don't want to tell the person. It's because if you have to go find the answer, you're more likely to remember it, right? Absolutely. And again, you're training adults, so yeah. they need to be independent. <laughs> they need to find out their own information, especially when you've given them the materials that in the resources that they just have in their pocket. Right, so you just right. have to nudge them to, to right. go to those resources. Right, right. But I could see how it would be easier to train somebody in the paper trail process if they actually had been physically through all the process, <laughs> right? Like, hello, lipo moment, love it. Okay, so, and then the last P is people. That's right. So that is week four, and that is then taking a step back and going back of the overview of the, the customer communication. So, for example, for a designer salesperson, that's going to be the, the sales process, so starting at the beginning of the week, taking them through the step-by-step -step and reiterating what you learned in week one from your observations, reiterating the tangible nuts and bolts, this is you know the first step. You give the customer a call, then you confirm the day before, then you show up to the job site and so on. So you're starting with that recap of the, the sales process for them. And same thing if it's you know administrative or install, there's a process for each role or should be. And so taking them through that process at the beginning, and then it's role playing the rest of the week. So actually making them practice those steps. It's no longer theory. When you get to week four, week four is we're preparing you to go out into the field and week five, you're going to be in the field. Mm. So they have to have actual examples of practice, whether it's in the office with you role playing or actually taking them out and having you as a safety net, um, but having them try the, the language of that process um, is going to be critical in week four because you can't put them into the field until they've tried it out once or twice themselves. Mm, okay. Okay. I love that too. And then when you do get to week five and you are going to put them out in the field, are they, you know, fly little birdie or do you kind of go along and let them watch you a couple of times? Or, I mean, we've done that in the first week, a little bit of shadowing, but do we then do that or do we shadow them that week? How do you suggest that happens? So it really depends on their progress. If you're getting to week four and they still are 
uh, nervous Nellies. Then we're going to allow them in the week five and week six to shadow one of the team members, yourself or another manager that you think does the process well. Do not just send them with someone that doesn't actually follow the process because they're going to learn the bad habits. <laughs> So you have to, if they're going to go with someone, they have to do the process well and be vetted for that, that step. But essentially, if they are, are the right candidate, they should be ready to go week five. And then therefore, you should be going and shadowing them and then coaching them in between your appointments or back at the office, what went well, what didn't. But you don't have to, to spend the whole week with them. You only have to spot check a couple of appointments because, again, we're, we're training independent adults. So they have to have done the homework up until this point. They would have had to practice it and, and be ready by week five, which is what we're telling them all along the way. Be ready. You're going out week five, and it's going to be up to you to be successful. Okay. I love it. I think it's great. And if it's not a salesperson, that we're training or a design assistant or a designer we're training, if it's a showroom administrator or an expediter, as I said, or something, then we're just putting them in the chair week five. And maybe we're around and we sit in and listen on a couple of calls or we're there to model a couple of calls, but they're going in the chair then, right? That's right. Okay. Okay. All right. And now this sounds outstanding. I, I have to say this sounds outstanding. And I know that each of us needs to do our own work to maneuver this, manipulate this broad process to our own firms, but it's doable. I can see that it's doable and you could cross it over and figure out how to apply it to the different positions in your own company. The thing about what's the next step is, is how do we set and monitor and make accountable the performance of the employees that we've hired? What are your, you know, we have to, you know, we have to set some goals up, but what, what does that look like, Jessica? Sure. So the very first thing is going back to that week one process um, on the very first day, it should be orientation day. And on orientation day, you got to give them a couple of different tools that they can utilize throughout their career. One of them is going to be that job description and or welcome letter that explains in detail what's expected of them um, and what is going to find them success. In addition to that, it's an employee manual um, that is the expectations of the, you know, the more HR related things about what do you do if, if there's a problem or, you know, discrimination or your cell phone on the job, like what are the rules of those sorts of things? So those all have to be established. And you also on orientation day, um, either the day, first day or second day, you establish goals. So they should know at the very beginning whether they are, you know, the front end of the process, meaning the, the designer salesperson or the back end, the expediter, the installer, they have to know um, what their goals are, those daily, weekly, monthly expectations. So it's, it's outlining that first. Then it's meeting with them after the training program at least once a week to go over those goals and go over what they are experiencing now in the field, now that they are out of training and have real life examples that they can ask you about. And then from there, after you're meeting weekly with them, then we have to do a 90-day review, so 90 days after their first start date, that really goes through their performance um, milestones. And the first milestone is training in 30 days. The second milestone is being able to... Um, with if it's a designer salesperson bringing in a certain amount of sales if it's a project manager it might be um handling a certain amount of jobs within that month so it's it's the numbers that you expect in the next 60 and then 90 days should improve upon that 60 day metric and so once you sit down with them and you review their performance in the 90 days, then it's going to be the, the come to Jesus meeting. Are we good with the training? Are we good with you and I and the culture of the business in order to move forward? Or is this really not the right fit for you? Because now you've been in it for 90 days and this is what we expect. So it's that 
that head on conversation at 90 days to make sure that it's the right fit before you invest more into them. Hmm. And, and so that's, you know, it's funny because I've always done that part. I haven't quite done all the other parts, <laughs> but I've always done that part of, we're going to sit down at 90 days and this is our time to say, you know, no hard feelings. It's working. It's not working. It might be working for me and not working for you. It might be working for you and not working for me, but this is the day we're going to look at each other's eyeballs and say, you know, you know, one, two, three, shoot. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yes or no. Right. Because, <laughs> right. Cause I, you know, I, I always want that safety valve because somebody can be performing their job and not fitting in the culture. Somebody could be performing their job, but not doing it as well as they, that you would expect based on your experience with past hires. Like, Or somebody could just not, you can see there's, we had it last year with somebody where I could just see at the, at, at the 90 day point, I had sort of a little, uh, and I was like, well, it's a lot. And, and, and the culture fit was good. You know, reliability was good, but grasping was a little less than desirable. And so I thought, you know, Vin and Bill and I talked about it. We're like, we'll give it another 90 days. But at that point, there wasn't a big change in the comprehension of all of the moving parts of the business. And I just remember looking at Vinny and Billy saying, like, I don't think if the light bulb's on now, it's not going on. Right. Yep. Exactly. And and you're gonna feel that um, in your gut, but it's also gonna be very evident when you set the goals and you set the metrics, whether or not they are accomplishing those metrics. Because you know, if you set those metrics, they're they're there for a reason. Whether you've accomplished that metric before or another employee has, you know, there is a benchmark for success. And if they're not hitting that and they're not actively improving, well, then there's going to be a problem and it's going to, it's going to continue to be a problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I was mostly going by my gut. I'm embarrassed to tell you because, I, well, and that leads to the question because I shouldn't say there was performance issues. I mean, but, but it wasn't as finite as the metric of the set goals, because I can see rationally how to set finite goals for a salesperson, but how do you set finite goals for office administrator? In other words, and I'll tell you, so I recently hired in, in, in May an office administrator, and I don't really have an expectation of anybody mastering that job for a year. I mean, and, and, and I, I have expectations of you mastering lots of steps along the way. But before I really look and say anything that happens here, you can handle it. It's usually a year. And, um, and that's just based on 39 years of training people and having them in my business doing that role. But I, as much as I have the job description, Jessica, and we go through, I'm not sure I've ever said, I require you to know this by 30 days, this by 40 days. And is that what you're telling me I should do that? I, I pick out the parts of the job and I just say by these dates, I need to see mastery of it. Yeah, essentially that is, is what I'm saying. And, and not necessarily mastery, but, um, closer to the goal mm -hmm, <laughs> that mm -hmm. there is improvement that they are actively trying and they're at least getting within range you know mm -hmm. maybe there was something that needed to be tweaked in the training process that is uh, allowing for the delay of their meeting their um their goal but that that is what i'm saying and and for that administrative person you just have to take a look at what are they doing on a, a daily basis so if it if it is a person that is just going to do miscellaneous projects, well, then maybe the, the metric is accomplish this project by X date. Hmm. Okay. 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 Yeah. You have to, you have to be creative in what the goals are. I hear you. You got, you got to get the, the, the big lesson that I'm hearing is because it's not a clear line, like a salesperson's goals. Don't assume that you shouldn't sit down and figure out the goals. That's the point. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I'll go back to the drawing board then. <laughs> <laughs> well, and here's the other thing that I would want to add to that is 
think about it, you know, Luann, you're a fabulous salesperson and you've always used some sort of sales process to find that repeated uh, success. Mm -hmm. And so the training process is, is very similar to that, that when you bring a new person in, you've got to do the process in sequence every single time the same way, because then otherwise, once you start getting to the 60, 90 or six months, you know, deadlines of these projects and metrics, if you didn't set the foundation right and you didn't actually go through all the training steps it's actually going to delay them from learning and accomplishing those goals and then you don't know if it's your fault for not training correctly or if it's them not comprehending right right i hear you i i hear that i have to say you know in real life taking this to real life i think the biggest challenge is is that you know, we don't typically hire when everything is under control. <laughs> you know what I mean? We mm -hmm. typically hire when we're, you know, crazy busy and we're like, we need more people, right? And so it's very difficult in real life to get quiet enough and to stop what you're doing to pay attention to an intentional training program. I have to say, I just think that's the honest to God truth of it. It's because, I mean, again, thinking of this new hire in May, and it's not that there wasn't intentional thought to the training, but at you know, some point, whether it's the first day or the third day, you're like, the phone's ringing. Somebody's got to get it, and I got to stop training you right now because I've got to answer the phone, right? It's you just don't have that extra body there to take care of all the things while you take care of the person. No answer for that. See, gotcha, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where you have to get all the other people involved, whether it's vendors or your contractors. It doesn't just have to be you. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> no, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. But as we get more sophisticated in our approach to training our employees, it probably gets easier for us to do that within the day to day of the business. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the biggest lesson is it's not going to happen if we don't apply it and don't try. Let's 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 go there. It can, mm -hmm. you know, it's never going to happen. So, yeah, there's room for improvement. There's always room for improvement. And, you know, the strides that um, I have seen, you know, Eileen now has she was just telling me last week that she has now worked with and um, helped over 50 interior designers uh, through their hiring and training process in the last two years since she's been coming on the podcast and people have been reaching out to her. And the feedback that I get from the designers that have invested in working with Eileen, and of course now they have the opportunity to work with you too, Jess, is is it is mind-blowing how it can really improve the, everything about your firm, everything, because what it is, is too, I know that you believe this too, is if you need to slowly or fast clean house and start with one good hire and then start to build a new team around that hire, because the next one's a good one as, as opposed to just, you know, chugging along with people, you know, that aren't in the right position, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's very difficult to, to add a new team member on when everyone around you is not the right person. Mm -hmm. So instead of focusing on growth, I'll call it adding to the team, focus on replacing first. Right, 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 right. Exactly. Right. Like putting the, you know, moving the chess game around. And, and, and it's funny yeah. because a, a couple of years ago, we had Janelle Fotopoulos on the show. And in her case, it was also um, helpful to just move people into different positions. And um, Joni Vanderslice had the same thing. She on the show, I'll put these episodes in the show notes, but um, both episodes focused around hiring and growing the team and so forth like that. And um, in each of their cases, they found that a particular employee was a great employee that wasn't performing well and it was discovered through you know lots of conversations and all of this stuff that they were in the wrong position 
and they weren't and that's Eileen's big thing everybody should work in the position that makes them happy you shouldn't plow mm-hmm. through and do the kind of work that you know you just don't really love but um, sometimes it's just moving the players into different chairs around right definitely and I always look to the organization first and and like you said, putting that um, chess table together because the cost to replace does cost so high. So if you can find it within your organization, do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. It is so, um, it is so, it's, it is so hard to do. We'll just say that, but it is so worthwhile doing right, Jessica. I mean, that's just it. I mean, you know, we talk about spending time or money and that and and training first of all attracting and hiring and then training the right people when you do it right and it takes a while and then when you train them and it takes a while it feels like you're spinning your wheels but when you do it fast and you put the wrong ones in and you don't put the energy and the time and the structure into training them you're just burning the money in turnover so it's one or the other right Exactly. And this type of work, the recruiting and the training, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm. So you have to be prepared to run that marathon. Yes. Yeah. That was my big aha. You know, I would find somebody that was good and Eileen and Lisa would be like, no, we're going to do another round of postings and get another 200 in resumes in. And I'm like, guys, (laughs) you know, but um, it is worthwhile when you find the right person. So, well, just I got to say, I'm just so thrilled. We're so lucky at Exciting Windows that we get the benefit of hearing you and learning from you um, all the time throughout the year in our Zoom calls and in our conferences twice a year. Um, but everybody else, they can, you know, work with you too. Just tell tell everybody the name of your company again and how to contact with you and how to reach out to you. Absolutely. So my company is Behind the Design. Our website is gobehindthedesign.com. And I'd be happy to talk to anyone, um, either via phone, email, just chat about their challenges. Um, and we can really help with all three of these things, recruiting for you, training with you, um, or building processes for your company, whether that's your recruiting process, training process, or any of your operations, you know, what to do when a project comes in, the behind the scenes, that sort of thing. So I'd be happy to talk with anyone um, about those things and, and get in touch. Oh, I also have Facebook and LinkedIn. So those are other ways. Perfect. I love it. Well, you know what, you know that I adore you and I think you're just so super smart. You get a hashtag smart lady. That's for sure. And (laughs) (laughs) I thank you so much, Jess, for sharing all of this expertise with us because a lot of us can take it and run with it. That's for sure. You know what I mean? Um, so thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. Okay, in a moment, I'm going to get into the takeaways and recap Jess's process. But first, let's say thanks to our show sponsor, Kirsch. Just like Exciting Windows, Kirsch is a valuable partner to you and to us, the window treatment professionals. Okay, more than 100 years of innovation in design, technology, in creating beautiful as well as functional drapery hardware for any window application you can imagine. Curved rods, ripple fold rods, decorative rods, hand draw rods, core draw rods, motorized rods. When I say everything you mean, I actually mean everything. Go to Kirsch.com to find a dealer near you. Now, I'm always interested in advice on recruiting and training. Between Window Works, the podcast, and now Exciting Windows, <laughs> I've got quite a growing team and it can get really crazy if I'm not intentional about how we hire and how we train, all right? But my advice is for you, take the time. Take the time on the front end, the way that Jess describes, invest the time, okay? So let's recap her very simple and actionable process to recruit and train your staff, all right? The first step takes, means taking a step back and breaking down the job description, right? Every single position in your company should have a job description and you should have it very clear. What do you expect out of this person? What traits are you looking for in this person? How will this person interact? And I keep saying person, but I mean the role, right? And what does it look like when this 
person is doing this role successfully. All right. I'll say to you too, for more information on this, Eileen's episode 589 is very helpful and kind of really piggybacks with this because these two ladies think a lot alike and it's nice. Another tip here, don't do what I used to do and hire somebody that's fun and outgoing and raring to go because that's what I am. Yep. I used to hire people that were like me. (laughs) Why not? Right. But it's not the way to go. You got to break it down and get clear. And that's why you start with the job description and what will take to be successful in that job description. Because when I just think about interviewing somebody, then I'm just thinking about my interaction with them, my role, my rapport with them. But when I think about the role and the job that I want them to do, now I understand that I'm not looking for somebody like me to do data entry because I could never sit and do data entry all day. It would make me crazy, literally. But there's people out there that love to do it. So that's why this clarity step on what is the job description and what are the traits of someone who will be successful at this job description is so critical, all right? So then we move to once you've got that hire, now Jess has got this four-week process, which was amazing and I love it. Week one, all about process. No matter where, what role you hire them for, no matter what level of hierarchy, I love this idea of exposing them to the big picture of the company by letting them shadow and see every single other person's role in the firm. This is a, this was a new thing for me, but I, it really opened my eyes how valuable it is for say a junior design assistant who might never be on, um, I don't know, a site visit with you to see how that site visit goes, to understand the information that has to come from that. Or, um, you know, I don't know, your expediter to go on the reveal install right? Because then they understand, oh, if I don't really lock it all down, this is the chaos that happens on the day. And of course, they deal with the chaos, the deficiencies when you come back with the list. But there's something very different between getting a list of the things that, hey, sorry, you missed these, these were missing, and being there and watching all of their team members freak out, like internally freak out because like there's only, you know, one end table and there's supposed to be two. It it really hammers it home how important everybody's job is and how everybody's job intersects. So I totally love week one. Week two, immersion into comp- your company's products and services. And I love her suggestion to, to consider splitting the products and services into categories and then further splitting them into days of the week. All right. So they can really give the time and not feel rushed to go through it. So for an interior designer, one day might be all about the tile and the fixtures that go into a kitchen and a bath, say. Another day might be all about furniture and case goods and all of those things, so soft goods and all the things that you guys say, right? (laughs) So idea is that you split it down um, into different categories and not just throw everything at somebody at once. So smart. By the third week, it's everyone's favorite, right? Paperwork. Who doesn't love paperwork? (laughs) Okay. I mean, you know, but again, If all you're doing all week is paperwork without all of the distractions of, oh, at nine o'clock, we're going to learn about, you know, upholstered sofas. And at 10 o'clock, we're going to learn about how to order a upholstered sofa. Like it sort of makes sense. Stay in the lane of what you're doing and it gets easier. I love it. I absolutely love it. Week four, focusing on people. How will this hire be expected to interact with the team and your clients? Consider taking them step by step through the sales process that you reviewed with them in week one. And to make it stick, role play and practice those steps with the conversations that they might have. So this is different for every firm, right? You might hire somebody that will interact with clients. So this is that role playing. This is what happens when we do a design presentation. This is for window treatments, people. This is what happens when we knock on Sally Smith's door, right? But for other positions on our firm, maybe it's phone interaction, or maybe again, it's, you know, interaction with the expediter and the bookkeeper. So it's just exposing them to the people and the types of conversations that they will have in the course of doing their job well, right? 
And then at this stage, you know, we're looking for that safety net to take them out and let them with you, with somebody of senior position in your firm, um, to meet the clients, the vendors, whatever it is that their role will be. Love, love, love. Because week five is go time, right? By now, they should be pretty comfortable and confident in the role, but we keep paying attention to their interactions with fellow staff members, and we must be really doing those spot check on their work and their client um, interactions, right? By this time, we should be looking pretty good and feeling pretty good, but we're not done right? This is the thing. This is where the tough keep going. I'm going to tell you, been there a thousand times. You have to make sure you stay engaged with your new hire by conducting weekly meetings. They don't have to be long. You can have the same agenda for each week. It will be a review of their performance as it relates to the established goals that you discussed with them at the time of the hire. And it's some time to give and receive some feedback, right? I promise you, if you do this, this investment of time, it saves you time in the wrong in the long run. It's not easy. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you it's easy. I'm definitely not. But every single year, month, everything that goes by and I enact more and more of these strategies that I've learned over the last several years from both Jessica and Eileen, I can tell you it really has changed our business for the better. All right. So um, I also want to just point out that in past episodes, I spoke with Janelle Fotopoulos on episode 364 and Joni Vanderslice on episode 101. These were conversations about when you discover that an employee is better suited for a different role in your firm and how um, that little tweak sometimes truly just changes the happiness for that person, the productivity for that person. And of course, that spills over onto you as the owner. There's no question. All right. So I want to say it's your choice. You do the work on the front end or burn time and money on the back end in turnover. And I highly encourage you to reach out to Jessica if you could use some help in this area. I know firsthand the impact that she has and she has made on my colleagues and their businesses with her hiring process. Absolutely outstanding. All right. Now, by now, you should know all about Luann Live. It's just around the corner, LuannLive.com. And I want to tell you a little story about my friend and colleague, Wendy Wallace-Chuck. Wendy was the very first person to register for Luann Live this year. The cart was open a hot minute and her registration came through. Wendy was at Luann Live last year. She's been at at least one, I'm not sure if two, of my Power Talk Friday tours. She's been on the podcast two times. And I want to let you know that she is the co-leader of a designer's Facebook group called Design for Today Collaborative, along with two other hashtag smart ladies and also alumni of the podcast, Debbie Daly and Marianne Cherico. So I just want to share with you, if you are looking for a group, a Facebook group that specifically supports interior designers, decorators, and home stagers, that this is a terrific group to join. They hold educational workshops in the New England area, as well as online. And, you know, you just can't miss when you're in a group whose leaders are strong, positive, supportive ladies like these three are. Find them on Facebook at Design for Today Collaborative. All right. Now, I hope that you will join me and Wendy and Debbie and Marianne and all of our other friends at Luann Live. Go to LuannLive.com. Huge thanks and shout out to Jessica Harling and a huge hello and shout out to all of my colleagues at Exciting Windows. This is going to be an amazing year. Let's decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.